Okay. Well, um, last night we began uh, the series by talking about uh, the last being first and the first being last, and that is going to be our theme uh, that, that will tie into tonight, as, as Brother Steve said, that, that will tie in, uh, and uh, tie into tonight, as, as Brother Steve said, that, that will tie in, uh, and uh, uh, kind of periodically we'll be maybe tying it into some things we talked about last night. Um, if you if you weren't here last night, though, that's okay. You won't you won't be uh, it won't be incomprehensible. Um, but we will be uh, referring now and then uh, from what we started with last night. Um, you can see um, the title on the screen is the leftovers uh, tonight. And uh, I remember when I was a kid. Um, Leftovers. If I asked my parents what we're having for dinner, and my mom said, "Last thing I want is not a word I associate positive things with." Um, and now, not so so much. You know, when you're an adult, you you can appreciate it. Sometimes you like leftovers uh, just as much or more uh, than the first time you eat it. But um, the Bible often uh, talks about. Well, I'll get to that in just a minute. Actually, before I uh, uh, talk about that, I'll think about some other things, but, um, but just uh, imagine, um, you know, taking, uh, you know, kind of spring cleaning uh, type of a thing. You, you go in there every now and then I open up my fr- uh, type of a thing. You, you go in there every now and then I open up my fridge and I see there's leftovers that I forgot about. I'm notorious also for forgetting my leftovers, as any of my roommates I've lived with would tell you. And so leftovers will be stuck in my fridge for a while. And um, it would be nice if I could take something time there, you know, by the time you think about it, that they're not worth eating anymore. Um, But just imagine that you had leftovers that were in your fridge uh, that you really didn't want anything to do with. Maybe some spaghetti from one night and some beef from another night and some tacos from another night. Well, what are you going to do with all tacos from another night? Well, what are you going to do with all of that? Imagine that you could take all of that and uh, somehow pull out your inner Gordon Ramsay and make just just a Thanksgiving feast out of it. Um, That's kind of what we see happening in the Bible um, with with how God operates. And and we'll uh, uh, kind of expand on that as we look uh, in Scripture tonight. If you want to turn to um, John chapter 6. John chapter 6. This is uh, a time when uh, Jesus 5,000 people, and he's done it miraculously. Um, we're not going to read the whole story, but Jesus takes uh, five uh, loaves, uh, a, a couple fish and five loaves, and he feeds 5,000 people with it, which is clearly uh, a miracle. Um, but then at the early uh, a miracle, um, but then at the end of the meal, um, uh, well, actually, we're going to read uh, the, the, in, in verse 11. We'll read the, 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 the meal, and, and we'll focus on the end here, though. John chapter 6 and verse 11. Uh, Jesus then took the loaf seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So Jesus... Um, Uh, instructs them and then in verse 13 so they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with so they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten Um, so uh, again notice the numbers that we start with Um, how many uh, loaves did we start with five how many baskets full of uh, leftovers are picked up 12. So, in the ancient world, a lot of times people would carry a basket with them, um, a bread basket. And they might carry a loaf in that so that if they're going out uh, to work or whatever, bring their bread around with them as, as a part of their meal. So, uh, they would have a, a, a basket that they uh, could, put, uh, could, could carry easily with them. Uh, and uh, so, obviously... A basket is going to carry at least one loaf, right? Uh, a basket can carry one loaf. 
12 baskets. That means there were there was more bread at the end of the feeding than there was at the beginning after everyone had eaten. And so Jesus picks up more than than what he has started with. So Jesus picks up more than than what he has started with. And also, I suppose we might read this and, and ask, uh, looking at verse 13, um, uh, or excuse me, verse 12, um, he says, you know, he instructs them, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. What is it that we know about Jesus that helps inform these words? Is Jesus known by his disciples as a really kind of a neat and tidy person, someone who doesn't like to waste food? And so he says, listen, guys, the feeding's over, the miracle is great, but make sure that you get the leftovers because sure that you get the leftovers because tomorrow we need to have something for, for ourselves or whatever it is. Is Jesus so uh, obsessed with cleaning up that, that, that uh, John decides to add this detail? Why would you even add this detail in the story? The miracle is the 5,000 people being fed. Who cares what, who cares what happens to the leftovers? Well, Jesus cares what, has, uh, what, what uh, happens to the leftovers. And notice again that he says um, to, to pick them up um, so lost. You know, he's concerned that all of the bread return to him. And what I want to suggest to you is that Jesus, in his concern for these leftover fragments of bread is drawing on a theme that is in the Bible, is drawing on a theme that is in the Bible, uh, that, that runs throughout the Bible. And it has to do with uh, the, the, the first and last, but, but it's not, we're not going to think of that yet directly. Uh, the theme that Jesus is drawing on of Israel being the, the leftover group, uh, the, the word in the Bible that is often used is the word remnant. And if you haven't heard the word remnant or you're not very familiar with it, uh, you can hear the word remain in it. Rem remnants tomorrow, we say leftovers. Um, and so the remnant is a, a theme that shows up even more specifically in the prophets. But this idea of the people who are left over is throughout uh, the Bible, and it starts the Bible, and it starts, well, this is not where it starts, but this is where we're going to start tonight, is with the people of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 7, if you'll turn there, Deuteronomy chapter 7, in verse 6, it says, it says, uh, this is uh, Moses speaking to Israel, and he says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because of other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. So when God looks down on the earth and he says, Hmm. There's a bunch of nations. There's Assyrians, there's Babylonians, there's Egyptians. And uh, he says, well, which people? Assyrians, there's Babylonians, there's Egyptians. And uh, he says, well, which people am I going to make my people? He chooses the fewest. The people who aren't even living in their own land. The people who are slaves in another country. A country that was day. And so Jesus, or God, looks down and he chooses uh, this slave people. And the story of Israel, from its selection uh, all through its history, can be told as, told as the story of God whittling down and getting to what is left over by the time uh, he has purified them. God is looking for a pure people, and uh, he, he chooses Israel out of Egypt, 
and chooses Israel out of Egypt. And so here are the, the, here's how you could tell the story. That he, out of Egypt, the, kind of the, the leftover people, the, 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 the lowest level people there, uh, God says, I'll take them. And he extracts them out of Egypt. But then uh, uh, he actually takes a, a, a smaller portion of them. Because you remember that in their history, uh, 10 of the 12 tribes uh, split off. And as we in our class here in, in Wilmington have been studying, those 10 tribes are rebellious. They have been studying. Those 10 tribes are rebellious. They're, they're in rebellion. And in Chronicles, it talks about them being in rebellion against God in Jerusalem. And so those are not the chosen people. Judah is the remnant. Judah is like the remnant of... And then we go from Judah and you whittle it down even more because they're taken into Babylon. And they're kind of taken through this time of history in Babylon and then people come out of Babylon and not everyone comes out of Babylon. As a matter of fact, most come back. Only... uh, you know, roughly uh, 50,000 or so people come back from Babylon in the initial return. And then uh, oh, throughout history, finally, God is, is he's making the remnant of a remnant of a remnant, and he's looking for the Israelite, and he gets down to the last Israelite, the one remnant, and that is Jesus himself. And that is... A course, uh, part of the course of history that God is working to, to purify His people, working to, to purify His people, and so He brings His people through these difficulties, and those who fail the test are kind of siphoned off, and and the faithful are left, and then they're siphoned off again until you get down to one faithful Israelite. This is illustrated in. Isaiah chapter 3, this, this purification process, the idea that God is taking Israel through these stages, um, you can see in Isaiah chapter 3. You can see it all over the uh, Isaiah, really, but we're just going to look at a few verses. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 1. A few verses. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 1. Behold, the Lord God of hosts is taking away from Jerusalem and from Judah support and supply all support of bread and all support of water, the mighty man and the soldier, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of 50 and the counselor and the skillful magician and the expert in charms. Who are all these type of people? These are the best. These are the best of the best. I'm taking away your scholars and your, you know, your leaders and uh, your top guys. I'm taking all of them away, your generals. All of those people that are the best and the brightest of your society, God says, I'm taking them away. And what's going to be left over is what God's going to be able to work with. Because the best and the brightest uh, of Israel become arrogant. The brightest uh, of Israel become arrogant. And they start oppressing those who are lesser than them. And so skip to uh, chapter 4 of Isaiah in verse 3. Isaiah chapter 4 in verse 3. He who is left in Zion and who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem from its midst by a spirit of judgment and by a spirit of burning. There's, there's going to be some people left, but it's only the, the wicked, the people who are shedding innocent blood and causing injustice. And so these hardships come upon all of Israel, and it's the survivors that God brings through the fire that he's going to be able to do something with. And thing with. And uh, furthermore, this... The survivors are, are called the leftovers or the remnant. And uh, we see in the judgment of Babylon that now Israel, God's people, are not only judged, but they're scattered. 
they're 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 in Babylon, which eventually they they kind of spread to other places. By the time of Jesus, we see them in all sorts of different places, and. God promises that I'm going to take those people who are clearly in judgment because they're not in the land that, with God that he promised them. I'm going to take them from all of those places. And I, Micah chapter 2 in verse 12. Micah chapter 2 in verse 12. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. And Jacob is just the name for Israel. He says, I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. When a shepherd calls his sheep in for the night, they may be kind of scattered out there in the uh, the pasture, and he's got to get them all together out there in uh, in the pasture, and he's got to get them all together in the pen keep them safe at night. And that's the imagery God's using here. I'm going to take my sheep who are scattered throughout the world and I'm going to gather them into one place. Isaiah, again, if you go to Isaiah chapter 30, Isaiah 37, beginning in verse 31. The surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go, out, uh, shall go a remnant, and out of Mount Zion a band of survivors. The zeal of... So these leftovers I'm going to take, and they're going to bear fruit. They're going to have uh, all of these blessings that I'm going to, to bring uh, upon them. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 1, says... Woe, destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and you have driven them away and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. So part of the judgment on God's flock has been as a result of this poor leadership, continuing in verse 3, he says, Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, um, uh, who will care for them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. So, Yeah, they've been scattered, they've been judged. Yeah, they've been scattered, they've been judged, but I'm going to call them back, again, using that shepherd imagery. And these people are not just going to be called um, back to God, but they're going to be blessed by God, as we've seen uh, in some of these passages. Micah chapter 4, in verse 6, expresses that blessing uh, pretty clearly. Micah 4 and verse 6, In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those whom I have afflicted. And the lame will make uh, lame I will make the remnant, and those who are cast off a strong nation. And the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. So they are lame and they are cast off and they are just kind of forgotten about people. But God says, I'm going to take those uh, lame people deformed, misfigured, take those uh, lame, deformed, misfigured people, so to speak. I'm going to bring them back, and I'm not just going to, you know, give them their own little place. They're going to be a strong nation, he says. They're going to be blessed, and I'm going to rule over them. God is going to take these leftovers, and the leftovers are really a second way of God choosing his people. God's chosen people, excuse me, God has chosen a people the first time in Israel people, and that's the remnant, those who survive the purification and the tests and so forth. And so we have two times where God is going to have a people. The initial time where he calls them out of slavery in Egypt and the time after the judgment of exile. 
and this second and this second people is going to have the same exact history as the first people there's going to be a second everything jeremiah chapter 16 jeremiah chapter 16 shows there's going to be a second exodus jeremiah 16 and verse 14 therefore 16 and verse 14 therefore behold the days are coming declares the lord when it shall no longer be said as the lord lives who brought up the people of israel out of the land of egypt but as the lord lives who brought up the people of israel out of the north country and out of all the countries where he had driven them for i will you realize how monumental this saying is what, what jeremiah is saying here to say that you know what i'm going to do something and you're going to forget about the exodus that's going to be just kind of you're not even going to think about me as being that god that's that's who god was jehovah and the one who takes them out that's the founding myth so to speak and i mean myth not in the sense that it's not true but the founding story of israel imagine thinking about that in america imagine someone saying you know what i'm thinking about that in america imagine someone saying you know what i'm going something's going to happen in america that's going to make you think just forget about the revolutionary war <laughs> that, that that we don't even look in the founding fathers and all of that we don't even think of them as our founding fathers anymore that would have to be a catastrophic event even think of them as our founding fathers anymore that would have to be a catastrophic event as a matter of fact, you would say, that's not, even, uh, that's not even America anymore, right? That's how big of a deal it is for Jeremiah to say this. There's going to be a second people, and God says, uh, you're not even going to think about, about the, the God of Israel who brought them out of the land of Egypt. And so this is a monumental expansion. And so there's a second exodus, but like we explored last night, the second surpasses the first the first becomes last and the last becomes first it's greater than the first exodus for this second people who are the last the remnant the leftovers of israel they're going to be greater than the first people and they're going to have a greater exodus than the first people and they're going to have a greater covenant than the first people jeremiah chapter 31 in verse 31 of jeremiah chapter 31 in verse 31 of one of the more familiar passages of Jeremiah. He says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by yoke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Again, harmony of what Jeremiah is saying here. You're going to forget the God that came down on Sinai, that, that boomed his voice and shook the earth, and the people saw him and were afraid, and, and, and it's the, the founding moment. God says, I'm going to make a covenant here. And I'm going to give a law again, but it's going to be new. It's going to be greater than the first covenant. They're also going to have a second David. Jeremiah chapter 30. In Jeremiah 30 in verse 8 says, And it shall come to pass that in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off your neck, and I will burst your bonds, and foreigners shall no more make a servant of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king. But they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Well, there's two ways of thinking about that passage, the, the, the verse 9 specifically. Either he's talking about a second David or he's talking about raising up David from the dead. He's talking about a second David or he's talking about raising up David from the dead. Of course, either way, uh, what he's saying is that David, there's going to be another David. 
and the second David is going to be greater than the first David. And of course, we could, we could just go through the whole Old Testament and do this. Uh, um, there is a second everything. And remember, as we talked about last night, the, the nature of Hebrew poetry, and if you weren't here last night, we just examined, examined um, how the second line of Hebrew poetry always expands upon the first line, that they have a parallel meaning, but the second line always carries forward in a greater way. And that's really what we have again here with the second history of God's second people, people. Everything in the Bible happens twice, but the second time surpasses the first. The last is greater than the first. Even Jesus is going to come twice. He came once, and the second time he comes. And so, over and over, this pattern is illustrated, and again, we, we don't have time to, to go into all of it. But I hope one thing we should take from this is the importance of the first. In emphasis, they are, we also noted last night that you have to establish the first in order to, to, to have the second be greater. And the first and the second lines of poetry aren't different in their fundamental meaning. And what that means is that when we go back, and what that means is that when we go back to our what we call the Old Testament, we can read stories that are applicable to us. Not because they have morality in them, although that is true, but we don't go back to the Old Testament stories looking at examples of how to be a moral person. Uh, actually, there's a lot of examples, uh, negative examples in there as well. Um, you can do that. You can get morality out of the Old Testament. But we're also living under the same story. And if we think, oh, that's past, and you know, the second's greater than the first, and so we don't need to worry. That's obsolete, and that's gone. We, I don't have to think about that anymore. No, it's the same story. And so you have to draw things out a little bit differently, but fundamentally, we're not doing anything different. But fundamentally, we're not doing anything different than what they were doing in the Old Testament. We're still coming out of slavery. We're still, we still have a David. We still have a Moses. We still have a promised land. All of those things are things that can inform us about our walk, are things that can inform us about our walk and uh, how we ought to live and act in the world. I'm gonna go back to John chapter six. John chapter 6 and leftovers. And what happens in the rest of the chapter after this miracle is uh, the people come back and they say, hey, we want more bread. And uh, Jesus starts talking to them and says, okay, let me tell you about the true bread. The true, and the true drink is my blood. And if you eat my body and if you drink my blood, then you can be my disciples and you can have true life. And, and, and this is a long conversation that we're not going to take the time to get into the details of that conversation uh, tonight. But he is, is feeding his, these people who have come out to see him. He is feeding these people with his words. Just as he fed them with bread then he starts talking to them and feeding them with his words. But you know what? They don't. And feeding them with his words. But you know what? They don't like the taste of his words as much as they like the taste of his bread. And what he proceeds to do, or maybe I should say what proceeds uh, to happen, is easy. And this is one of those stories in the Bible where if you think you wouldn't have acted any differently, I would, I would challenge you on that. If I stood up here tonight and told you that you need to eat my body, 
you would say, well, either... Um, because they start asking Jesus about, well, what does that mean, eat your body? And you know what he does not do? He doesn't clarify. He doesn't say, you know what, it's just like a spiritual, it's a metaphor, don't get wrapped up in it. It's, he, never, he doesn't do that. He says, no, I said what I said. You eat my body and you drink my blood. And their reaction, and their reaction is, ugh. Well, verse 60 is ultimately their reaction. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? And listen to it. And I don't know if I'm showing my own weakness here, but that's the least that they should be saying. This is a hard saying. To say that it's hard <laughs> it's, uh, is, is almost kind. It's insane. Kind. It's insane. And what happens is the same thing that happens in Israel. Remember we talked about the history of God whittling down his people and getting to that remnant. That's the story of Israel. And what happened of Jesus' words to these people is that he starts whittling down all of these people who came out to see him, and he's going to find out who really wants to follow him. John, uh, can continue uh, in verse 61. But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. He does finally expand on some things about his, uh, the, the nature of his, about his, uh, the, the nature of his words. But then, let's skip down to verse 66 to see. It says, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. They didn't like he had to feed them. And so Jesus, through his words, successfully has whittled down his followers. And he says in verse 67 to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we know that you are the Holy One of God? And Jesus gives an answer of faith there. It's not some of the kind of resounding faith that Peter's famous for. He's, it's almost like, well, I, I don't know what else, where else I would go, but it is faith to say, I don't know where else to go. You are the Holy One of God. But he doesn't say, oh, I understand what you're saying, and I, I get you, and these people don't understand. He says, well, I, I'm kind of with them in, in, in feeling how, how I feel about what you just said, but I don't know what else to do. I tr I'm going to have to trust you how I feel about what you just said, but I don't know what else to do. I tr I'm going to have to trust you. I know that you're the Holy One. And so Jesus gets down to notice again the twelve. And how many fragments are left over of the twelve? And how many fragments are left over of the feeding of the five thousand? Twelve. And of course, he starts off with 5,000 people, gets down to 12. Out of these 12 men, they come thousands upon thousands a month, uh, as we see these 12 eventually going into the world and making a people that are much greater than them. And so this remnant, the 12 becomes the remnant. They become the leftovers. And out of those leftovers, God builds his church through Jesus. And it is in his church that he is beginning to glorify himself in the world in a way that he will ultimately fully glorify himself when Jesus comes again. So the question, so the question for us is... Maybe twofold, depending on where you're at tonight. The question is, are you going to be a part of the remnant? 
because you may be not and there's a small group of people who uh, out of the people in history and out of the world that, 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 that are people of God but there's another question, aside from are you the remnant, are you the, the people out, that called out of the, the greater number, are you going to be a remnant of the remnant? Just because God chose Israel doesn't mean that all of Israel was faithful and got to see the promised land. God is doing with him. He's putting them through trials and God is going to ultimately choose those who come out pure on the other side. Turn to Luke chapter 13. It's the last passage we'll look at tonight. Luke chapter 13. It says uh, of Jesus that he, went, that he went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? So he has some understanding of the remnant, right? How, how many people are going to be saved? He knows the story of Noah. You know, out of only eight people are saved out of the whole world. Noah, you know, out of only eight people are saved out of the whole world. Is it going to be like that? Is it going to be a few people? Verse 23, Jesus said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and will not be able... When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. And then you will begin to say, but he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. Are there going to be few people? Well, he says, find the narrow way. But there's going to be people who say, well, we came in your name. And he says in verse 29, people will come from east and west and north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. There's going to be, there's a lot of people who will say, as Jesus says in other places, Lord, Lord, did we not do things in your name? And um, and so forth and that's true out of maybe people who call themselves Christians that maybe maybe but it's also true of people that you and I might consider to be Christians ultimately God is the judge and he is a gracious judge and he's not looking to uh, find people who are uh, looking to get people so to speak he is, so to speak. He is going to allow everyone in that wants in. But it's only going to be those who truly want in. And so many times that ends up being those who are last. The people up being those who are last. The people who are lame and blind and deaf and so forth. Those people who have nothing to hold on to in this world, those are the people who turn to God. And that's why it's difficult for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Because they have something to hold on to. They're first in the world. And I don't want to give up being first in the world in order to be last. And God says, if you trust me and make yourself last, I'll make you first. And so God's chosen people with our second history are going through a second purification the question for you is will you be left over when God says I want to make sure that none of the broken pieces are missing are you going to be one of those that he gathers to himself 
and brings in to the age that the elf and brings in to the age that the age to come the invitation is for you tonight if you are here and you have not been baptized maybe you need to put on Christ you need to have a second version of yourself join the second well the way to do that is to have a second time through the Red Sea and we call that baptism you go through the Red Sea and you become God's second people and you can journey to his second promised land but you have to go through that Red Sea first and so if you're a Christian and you're going through the second wilderness the wilderness of this world and maybe you're doubting him Maybe you're looking around saying, I don't feel like God is treating me like I'm someone who is first. I don't feel like I can trust God to take care of me. And, and maybe that, that self. Maybe you need to repent of that and put your trust in God again. If that be your need, uh, or if you need to come forward and uh, confess Jesus as Lord, whatever the case may be, won't you come now while we 